talk given by Father Altenbach. Uh, let the opening words of tape two on the true mass be the same as on tape one. Namely, it is the mass that matters. Early in the 1930s, Father Dennis Fahey wrote in his book entitled The Mystical Body of Christ and the, and the Reorganization of Society, these words which are now a prophecy fulfilled before our eyes. Quote, All the frightful energy of Satan's hatred is especially directed against the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Arrayed with him and animated with the same hatred, there is an army of invisible satellites of the same nature. All their efforts are directed toward preventing its celebration by exterminating the priesthood and toward curtailing its, its effects. If Satan cannot succeed in completely doing away with the one acceptable act of worship, he will strive to restrict it to the, uh, to the minds and hearts of as few individuals as possible." Unquote. Truly then, it is the mass that matters. And this is why I choose that heading as the best fitting my remarks, comments, observations, or advice on this follow-through of tape two. I take for granted that you have heard tape one. Any repetition of ideas is meant to be reinforcement of what I'd said previously, as also to point, a, point, some, point to some, some conclusions which I submit uh, you, find, you will find inescapable. The only Mass that matters is, of course, the true Mass of Pope St. Pius V which incorporates all of the main doctrines of the Holy Eucharist, both as sacrifice and as sacrament, defined for all time by the dogmatic Council of Trent. The proposition I constantly keep in mind while making these comments and observations is this, the true Mass of Pope St. Pius V versus the so-called New Mass, the Novus Ordo, Serious study prompts me to state it more plainly as the, the true mass versus the new jazz. I am not trying to seem irreverent. To me, it is the same as stating a true $100 bill versus a counterfeit, counterfeit $100 bill. Of course, the comparison limps badly since the new, new auto is such a bad counterfeit that it is quite alarming that Millions of Catholics do not open re revolt. They have been gradualized, cajoled, deceived, and compelled into first tolerating, then getting used to the Novus Ordo, and finally gotten, gotten to like it. The tragic consequences must be shouldered by the pastors of souls, whose dedicated duty it is to guard the deposit of the divinely revealed truths of the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. The universal deception which ensued the great betrayal is unprecedented in Church history. This deception of the masses was perpetrated through the mass deception, that is, a deception via the perversion of the holy sacrifice of the mass. The true Mass has not been changed, it has been replaced by something essentially different, a Protestant meal for a true Catholic sacrifice. The, Otani the Ottaviani intervention spells out the details of the fraudulent Novus Ordo. Incidentally, this entire document is available on cassette from the same source as this tape. We mentioned only two sentences from its eight-point summary. Quote, The Novus Ordo has every possibility of satisfying the most modernist Protestants. And number two, quote, The Novus Ordo teems with insinuations or manifest errors against the purity of the Catholic religion and dismantles all defenses of the deposit of faith." Unquote. It is not only the divine right of every Catholic to reject the Novus Ordo and to demand the true Mass, but it is a most serious duty and obligation. The true Mass is the heart of the Catholic Church, and the true words of consecration are the heart of the true Mass. See what happened. 
The doctors of our church have done something worse than to induce a heart attack in our church. They have dared to perform a fatal heart transplant, substituting a plastic heart for the true heart of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. No wonder that this plastic mechanical thing, the Novus Oro, which these sabotaging surgeons have satanically implanted into the mystical body of Christ, is being rejected for its soul-sickening effect on the rank and file of faithful Catholics. Open eyes and open minds see this plainly. Destroy the heart and you destroy the body is equivalent to saying, destroy the true mass and you destroy the mystical body of Christ. No one is more determined to create such a sickening condition than Lucifer and company. And Satan's unprecedented success may be judged by the rapid demoralization of the members of the mystical body of Christ. The pulse beats of the mystical body are slowing down in proportion as the true mass is being suppressed. Today, after one decade of heart surgery, the pulse beats are low, slow, sluggish, and irregular. The divine guarantee of Jesus to be with his church all days makes this analogy limp badly too. For we know that in God's own time, there will be a full recovery, plus also a new start on a new shore, divinely and providentially planned, another resurrection after the assassins have vainly tried to substitute the death of the Novus Ordo in place of the life of the true mass, Malachi's prophecy will always be fulfilled. From the rising of the sun, even to the going down thereof, my name is great among the Gentiles, and there is offered in my name a clean oblation. That clean oblation is the true mass. It is the unbloody renewal of the eternal and bloody sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. This is the issue no ifs, ands, or buts whatsoever. In one word, the issue is transubstantiation. Anyone who dares to attack this issue in whatever denotation or connotation of that one word, such a person is a heretic, a perverter, an enemy of Jesus Christ. He is anathema. And this, ipso facto, that is, automatically, because he violates a law to which, to which violation the penalty of excommunication is attached. The true mass is the very heart of Christ's mystical self, and anyone who dares to replay this, replace this true heart with the cheap synthetic imitation of the Novus Ordo is anathema by this very act, which needs no further enforcement. Read the decrees of Trent if you need any verification of this claim. Read the, the quo primum. Read the canon laws. Read the liturgical laws. None of these have been abrogated. Nothing in heaven or in the, in the created universe is as important as needed, is holier, is a greater gift of God than the true mass. Therefore, it is the Mass that does matter. Without the true Mass, this world would become unlivable, physically and spiritually, temporally and eternally. Without me, you can do nothing, our Divine Lord assured us. This is literally true, because he is the one without whom nothing was made that was made being true God and true man. The true Mass is the source of all graces, containing grace in person, Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior. We could more readily exist if the sun stopped shining than if the true Mass stopped completely. The reasoning is simple. See for yourself. Assuming there is an all-powerful, all-just, all-knowing, all-wise, and all-holy God, is it possible that such a God would stand for one moment 
for the criminal misuse of the great gifts of intellect and will with which he has endowed man? Of course not. That is, unless some adequate reparation were at hand. What is this reparation, if not the holy, the true mass? Without that holy sacrifice of Calvary, no salvation. Without the true mass, because it is Calvary's renewal, no salvation. This is God's merciful arrangement, not yours or mine. Our wildest imaginations could not conjure up one detail to add to that which Almighty God did out of merciful love for man. And what is man's response? Today's men of the world, sadly joined by Catholics, loudly echo the cruel clamor of the Pharisees. Crucify him! His blood be upon us and upon our children. Do not blame the Jews. Blame today's Catholics, who with the devil's diligence are crucifying the mystical Christ, who are cooperating to bring about the total destruction of the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. The heartbeat of the mystical Christ is already slow and unsteady and becoming more critical as the suppression of the true mass proceeds. Will the time come when perhaps most Catholics will have no true mass available at all? Then what? The Holy Rosary will be their last weapon of defense. Then, with the, true, with the last true mass heartbeat of the mystical Christ, we must take refuge in the Immaculate Heart of His Mother as the only refuge left for the surviving faithful. It may be prudent to obtain on tapes the celebration of the True Mass. It will help faithful Catholics to preserve the sound image of the true Holy Sacrifice, like that offered to shut-ins on radio and TV, it would be the best substitute for private Sunday family devotions where no true mass exists, at least until things get better, after perhaps getting much worse, perhaps so. How much worse can things get? Well, without overstating, Try to see how tragically serious the situation of our Holy Mother Church actually is at the present time. Suppose we draw up an incomplete sample list of topics and suggestions for serious consideration. One, consider the bitter fruits which followed upon the suppression of the true mass and the promotion of the Novus Ordo in its place. Consider the doubtful validity of the Novus Ordo and certain validity of the true mass. How easy and compelling is a right choice. Three, since there is nothing more important than the true mass, it follows as a serious obligation to choose the more certain rather than the less certain or doubtful path. Four, Pope St. Pius X's encyclical on modernism indicates that cleaning the Augean stables by papal condemnation of modernists, heretics, of perverters, of Catholic faith and morals is long overdue. Five, time is also overdue for churchmen to recognize their automatic excommunication incurred by their violation of relevant church laws still unabrogated. Six, it is time for churchmen to realize that their violation of serious unabrogated laws like this causes an erosion of all church authority. Seven, consider the contrast between Pope St. Pius V's Quo Primum of, of 1570 and Constitution on the Novus Ordo in 1970. 8. Consider the distinction between 
infallibility, and impeccability. How the former is misapplied and the latter applied heretically. 9. Consider the mystical Christ now again crucified, bleeding to death. Consider that he suffers more Eucharistically from Catholics now than he did historically from the Jews. 10. Consider that turning the altar will always be equivalent literally to slamming heaven's door and opening the doors of hell. 11. Consider that we must expect from bishops and priests what we expect from children, namely, not to apply impeccability to superiors. 12. Distinguish between sacrilege and a sacrifice. Apply this to the Novus Ordo and realize that Satan craves for a valid sacrilege. 13. Realize that children are sacrificed to Moloch by the thousands, never more so than when the true mass was replaced by the Novus Ordo. 14. Our Lady's warnings through her seers and tears is much ignored. Yet she said, all problems can be solved by the rosary. 15. Consider the contrast between the Old Testament sacrifices of creatures and the New Testament sacrifice in which Jesus Christ, the Creator become man, is both priest and victim in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the very renewal of the eternal sacrifice of Calvary. Consider, too, how strictly God enforced Old Testament ritual and contrast this strictness with how blasphemously lax his New Testament priests are conducting their optional ritual. 16. Consider the Christ-centered, God-centered true Mass replaced as it is now by the man-centered Masonic Novus Ordo Seculorum. And you have then a picture of a loyal hierarchy reduced to a Judas goat hierarchy. 17. Contrast the complaints of the Sacred Heart at Paré le Monial of neglect, coldness, and indifference to him by his friends. Contrast this with the blasphemy, the insult, the insults, the violence, and destruction in his Eucharistic dwellings by his so-called friends of today. 18. Consider how today many Catholics, instead of crowning Jesus as their King of Kings, crown his heart with thorns, plant another cross into his pierced heart, and surround it with flames of hateful irreverence. Such is an incomplete list of possible topics for our consideration in view of what we must think when the modern pilots once again present the thorn crown scourged, mocked, and mutilated mystical Jesus to us. Behold the man. Behold your mystical Christ. Behold his church. Behold the mutilated mass. In summary, contrast the former loyal obedience to our church's teachings on faith, morals, and worship with the present liturgical anarchy, the brash sensuality, and the Masonic modernism which make a mockery of the mystical Christ, a worshiping in what still is rated as the celebration of the Eucharist, in one or the other mainly arbitrary form of the Novus Ordo Missae, truly the new order of deception. Well, here is a sermon 
which I preached on the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi in 1973. Behold, I am with you all days. Our divine Lord promised this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. Our divine Lord literally meant what he said, because on the occasion when he announced this, some of his disciples left him, saying, How can this be? He let them go. He explained no further. They had understood him correctly and literally, and Jesus meant it, had meant it literally. He turned to his apostles and asked, Will you also go? And Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Behold, I am with you all days. Jesus had told them that he would leave them, and at another time he told his apostles that he would stay with them. What would he do about this apparent contradiction? He would arrange for a way of leaving them and of staying with them, too. On the night before he died, he gathered his apostles around him for the ceremonial meal of the Passover, which was also his farewell dinner. But much more than this, it would be the occasion when our Lord would institute the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. This would ensure not only his mystical presence in the world to the end of time, but also his real presence among us in the Holy Eucharist, all days even unto the end of the world. He took bread and wine into his venerable hands, looked up to heaven and gave thanks to his heavenly Father, and then pronounced those words of change, the words of consecration, those words of transubstantiation by which the bread and wine became at the same, at that moment, his Eucharistic self, body and blood, soul and divinity, really and truly. There are no simpler words in any language than these simple words of transubstantiation by which we predicate something of something else. To a child, you say, this is is a chair. This is an apple. There is no simpler way of saying something, and yet it is not the complicated, difficult passages and phrases of Holy Scripture which cause the most controversy, debate, and variety of interpretations. No, it is these few simple words which cause the greatest controversy, the greatest variety of interpretations and debate among the so-called Christian denominations. Actually, there are more than 200 different interpretations to the simple words of our Lord, this is my body, this is my blood. And sadly, we must say, these Protestant interpreters are now joined by those who rate themselves as Catholics, as Catholic Christians including priests and bishops, who make light of these simple, direct, and literally true words of Jesus Christ. At present within the Church, these words of transubstantiation are being attacked in spite of their clear denotation and connotation. This is the great issue. Here are the words. Take and eat ye all of this, for this is my body. Take and drink ye all of this, for this is the chalice of my blood of the New Testament and Eternal Testament, the mystery of faith which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. As often as ye shall do these things, ye shall do them in memory of me. The Greek phrase anamnesis, which is translated in memory of, or in remembrance of, denotes not only a recalling to mind, but a doing over 
of the same thing Christ did at his first mass, the Last Supper. The Old Testament sacrifices were instituted by God himself, together with the specific words and ceremonies to be used. Read these Old Testament books, Leviticus especially. When, God, when given through Moses, the chosen people unanimously promised to obey every detail. Throughout Old Testament history, these chosen people of God swung like a huge pendulum from one side to the other, towards God and away from God. And whenever they swung towards God, they enjoyed spiritual and material prosperity. When they swung away from God, they were in misery. They suffered the punishment of moral decadence, of strife, of crime, and of defeat. The New Testament pendulum has now swung away from God. This accounts for the almost universal punishment, the loss of the true mass, its suppression, its persecution, its phasing out. Remember that the Old Testament sacrifices of animals and of the produce of the earth these were only the shadow of the holy sacrifice of the Mass to come in the New Testament, a foreshadowing, a prophecy and symbol, a prediction, a preview of the new true Mass sacrifice. Many of the prophecies of the Old Testament, especially those of Isaiah, confirm the time when, the place where, the manner how these prophecies were to be fulfilled, in the sacred person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, then his hidden and public, public life of 33 short years, his sufferings and his crucifixion and death on Calvary, his resurrection and finally his ascension into heaven in the sight of his apostles, the founding of his church, which was to be the myst his mystical self, the very heartbeat of which would be always a, re a renewal of his eternal sacrifice of Calvary, namely the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This heart is important. What can you do when your heart stops? This would be the source of all supernatural life to the end of the time, to the end of time. The true Mass, the perpetual renewal of the holy sacrifice on the cross, this was done by the commandment, by the command of Jesus when he said to his apostles, Do this in commemoration of me. This means, do what I have done. Literally, do the same thing. This is why the priest impersonates Christ. Bending over the host, the priest does not say, This is Christ's body. He says, This is my body impersonating Christ. This is all literally true, no ifs, ands, or buts. And so after the change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the author of grace himself is received in holy communion by the faithful, even as our Lord gave himself eucharistically to his apostles at the Last Supper. The holy sacrifice of the Mass does not consist of some animal or produce from the earth to be sacrificed like in the Old Testament, but contains God himself, body and blood, soul and divinity, really and truly and substantially. The true Mass has been offered these 20 centuries according to the most dignified manner prescribed by the Church, down to the last detail of ceremony and rubric. In view of this fact, may we not say, let us have one good reason for allowing the liturgical anarchy of today to go on for even one moment without prompt condemnation. We do not even hear a mild censure from our spiritual leaders who are the successors of the apostles and who have nothing in heaven or on earth to guard, them, nothing greater to guard than this gem, this jewel, this divine gift of God's love the true Mass, nothing. Nay, we might ask, should we not be given one good reason from those in control 
those who give tacit approval to the horrendous blasphemies and sacrilegious. One good reason why they are horatious at the bridge, when, uh, when here and there some traditional priest offers the true holy sacrifice for the people. Would you think that such a stance is prompted by heaven? Or would you agree with those who say that it is from the evil spirit of Lucifer? Let us consider the three main parts of the Mass, the offertory, the consecration, and the communion. A brief word on each of these parts, though each is a subject uh, deserving full treatment. What is the essence of each of these parts? How does the Novus Ordo square with each of these parts? Take the offertory. The bread and wine we offer at the offertory represents you and me, us. We put ourselves on the pattern and in that chalice. We are represented by food, bread and wine, that by which life is sustained, therefore an apt symbol of life. Invariably, as we place ourselves on that golden pattern and into that golden chalice, we can say, with a good resolution, Dear Lord, I hope next time I attend Mass I will have something more worthy to place upon that pattern in terms of my life's actions and energies spent during the week and something more worthy to put into that chalice. We pray for this humbly, dear Lord. Take the consecration. Here, besides the change of substance of the bread and wine, there is another aspect which you and I might well take to heart. As the priest bends over the bread and wine and speaks the words of change, producing this change of substance, at that moment Jesus bends over you and you and says, You are mine, even as I am yours. Change the substance of your life to conform to my will, to my example as portrayed in the gospel. Take the communion. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. Two conditions are demanded for a worthy Holy Communion. First, we must be free from mortal sin. That is, we must be in the state of grace, free from unconfessed mortal sin. Second, we must have the right intention. We may not receive Holy Communion out of routine, out of human respect, but to please God and to overcome our sins and defects. And we might note here that the Church never taught that Holy Communion is a reward for being good, but that Holy Communion is primarily as a means of our becoming better. This is important for the eternal and temporal welfare of our souls. And how does the Novus Ordo square with all this? You must have noticed that in the last decade there was a tremendous increase in Holy Communions and very few confessions. Are we suddenly to conclude that all these people became better overnight and do not need to go to confession? You may draw your own conclusion. Is our Lord just as pleased with spiritual carelessness as with carefulness? Go through the list of changed attitudes and see how many, if any, improvements toward greater reverence you discover because of the Novus Nova Ordo. Why, to call a Novus Ordo a mass is an inappropriate compliment. It is rather a parody, a lampoon, a shell of sham, and through arbitrary experimentation has in countless instances become a farce. But unfortunately, a blasphemous farce. Satan appears as an angel of light to these people, telling them how mature they are, how well educated, that they do not need all this medieval stuff. Well, God loves the simple, those with the simple faith of a Breton peasant. 
That's what God wants. Man fell because of intellectual pride. His way back to God is by intellectual humility to believe what our divine Lord said and to accept what he literally meant and to live by it. Yes, indeed, we may question many things about the Novus Ordo as we see it going on. From what we hear, priests speak from the pulpit, we must conclude that their intention can hardly be right. For a valid sacrifice, there must be three things proper and correct, namely the matter, the form, and the intention. If one of these three is wrong, the sacrifice is invalid. The Novus Ordo is contrary to the still unabrogated laws of the Church, the quote primum of Pope St. Pius V, and the other laws regulating the liturgy, a slight gesture and an expressed wish of Pope Paul VI does not abrogate these laws. More on this later. If we look carefully, we will see in the Novus Ordo the maneuverings of those who now occupy the position of the successors of the apostles. These men are trying their best to phase out the true mass and to promote the aberrations of the Novus Ordo. This is not the work of the Church of God, but the work of Satan, the synagogue of Satan. The apostates have again nailed the mystical Christ to the cross. He hangs there on the cross of modernism, the cross of heresy, the cross of apostasy. God only knows how many of these heretics and apostates occupy high positions in our church, and our Savior now hanging on this cross of the Novus Ordo is suffering more insulting blasphemies, more sacrilegious violence from those who pose as his friends than he ever suffered from the Pharisees at the time he was crucified on Calvary. These men at least openly declared themselves as his enemies and did not pose as the modern apostates do as his friends. Well might the Sacred Heart of Jesus complain at Parade of Monial about the coldness and neglect and indifference and the hostility of his friends. Well has his Blessed Mother echoed these same complaints at La Salette, at Lourdes, and at Fatima, repeating his plea for reparation, prayer, and penance. Let us make a sample list of reasons for such requested reparation. Ten of them briefly stated. One, the sacrilegious and blasphemies against the Holy Eucharist that are committed today both as sacrament and as sacrifice. Yes, reparation number two, for the deforming of Catholic worship from a God-centered to a man-centered thing. Three, reparation substitute for the substituting of barbaric tunes for dignified music in our churches. Each item is a subject in itself. Four, reparation for phasing out Eucharistic holy hours and other devotions and substituting democratic meetings of boards and councils and committees devoted to further impoverish the sacred liturgy by the arbitrary notions suggested by people who are incompetent in these matters. Five, reparation for demolishing of altars, statues, communion rails, and other furnishings and substituting burlap banners for these truly, for these true visual aids. Six, reparation for building churches which look like recreation halls, like filling stations or Masonic halls. Seven, reparation for wrecking sanctuaries and giving them the appearance of Masonic meeting place, meeting places, presidential chair, Passover table and all. Eight, Reparation for the priests who retain only those sacred vestments which keep up the outward appearances to deceive the unwary faithful into thinking the Novus Ordo is the same as the true Mass. Nine, reparation for omitting 70% of the true Mass prayers, many genuflections and crosses, and other significant ceremonies. Ten, reparation for the criminal act of inducing a heart attack in the mystical body of Christ by replacing the true sacrifice with a sacrilege, the Novus Ordo. 
reparation for suppressing the true mass and promoting its very opposite to new the Novus Ordo? Reparation for this bitter ingratitude of man towards God's lavish, generous gift? The holy sacrifice of the mass? Oh, much is said today about signs and symbols. I point to these to three symbols which are inseparable from the true holy sacrifice of the Mass, each symbol expressing eloquently and elegantly the tremendous lover of man who God is. These symbols are the crib, the crucifix, and the altar. Why the crib? Out of love. Why the crucifix? Out of love. Why the altar? Out of love. Let's go into this. Answered. I am God because I am God become man without ceasing to be God. I am the maker and sustainer of all things in existence. I came into a crib to retrieve proud and avaricious man by a divine demonstration of the virtues of poverty and humility. I did this out of love for you. Why the crucifix of Calvary? I did this to convince man that in his fallen state, that one kind of suffering or another, one kind of persecution or another, is unavoidable for those who determined to come after me, who said, if you wish to be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow me. Will we do this out of love? Why the altar of the Holy Eucharist? to keep demonstrating down the ages to all of us something very important to our divine Lord, namely, that regardless of the condescending cost to him through countless sacrileges and blasphemies, he would keep demonstrating to us that nothing less than total consecration works, nothing less than total dedication when we deal with him who is our God and our all. He is today demonstrating this to the last drop of his precious Eucharistic blood, now being so recklessly regarded in so many sacrilegious sanctuaries. He did this out of love. We are living in a world of compromise and appeasement, appeasement of which our divine Lord is intolerant. You are with me or you are against me, he says. If you do not gather with me, you are scattering. Objective reasoning and logic compel us to conclude from the plain evidence that the Novus Ordo is an exercise in consummate hypocrisy, in that it uses Catholic channels of Eucharistic piety in a perverse manner other than adoration of Jesus truly present in the Blessed Sacrament of this perverse exercise is now in the process of eclipsing the true mass in its sacrificial as well as in its sacramental aspects. In no way at all has the Novus Ordo drawn man higher to God. Rather, it has crudely attempted to drag God down to man's lowest barbaric level. Reasons indeed for reparation. We beg Jesus to be among those who will appreciate his promise to be with us all days. Here he is on our altar, all heart. The sacred heart of Jesus in his Eucharistic personified presence. Divine love in person. He quietly repeats to us, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God as I did. Love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart as I did with thy whole mind, as I did, with all thy strength, as I did, indeed, as he did.
in the crib, on the cross, on the altar. Will you be with me all days? He is now asking you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At the very beginning of this evil avalanche of false liturgical renewal, our faithful Catholics ought to have been getting warnings from the pulpits of our Catholic churches. Instead of the bread of truth, they were given... ...bread of truth, they were given the stone of deception. Instead of the way, the truth, and the life which Christ declared himself to be as the food of our souls, false shepherds fed the faithful on Satan's lies, on macabre death, and on the path that leads to hell. Their Masonic modernism was dramatized cleverly under the guise of the most sacred action of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, a camouflage. Enough was retained of the external appearances to deceive even the elect. Deprived of the true Eucharistic nourishment and drugged, as it were, by the new jazz, these souls were hypnotized into a sort of coma which makes their normal response to the true epistolic mass almost impossible. Something. All meaning souls say, but I like it. Yes, never mind if it makes sense or not. Never mind if it is true or not. Never mind if, if it is valid or not, as long as you like it. In the manner of the present new speak, that same cry to crucify the Eucharistic Christ is, but I like it. How bad can the liturgical trend become before it gets better? At the present rate of descent, there will be little altitude left. On the one hand, Pope Paul VI insists that the words of consecration shall remain the same. On the other hand, each priest makes up his own liturgy to suit what he deems to be relevant. That is the way it goes in many of our churches, and so you might just have one or the other doubtfully valid sacri sacrilege become a, a valid sacrilege, depending, of course, on the right matter, form, and intention. Lucifer wants nothing more than a valid sacrilege. Satanists want only a truly consecrated host to desecrate in their Satan worship. Never will they use the unconsecrated bread of a Protestant church. Pope Paul VI says that the words of consecration shall remain the same as always. Pope St. Pius V said in his Quo Primum, that not one word, not one gesture may be changed in the Roman Missal, which he restored to its apostolic purity in 1570, in response to the command of the dogmatic Council of Trent. It should be emphasized here that Pope Paul VI did not abrogate the document of Pope St. Pius V called Proquimum, Quo Primum, in which every device of language is employed to make it firm and binding for all time, in perpetuity, as the document states, an anathema, the penalty of excommunication, is incurred by anyone who dares even change anything in his Roman, Roman Missal and the Missale Romanum, the Novus Ordo, is a replacement of something quite different from the true, true Mass sacrifice. The Novus Ordo is a Protestant meal, a Protestant memorial. No wonder that Protestant theologians agree that now they can say this Novus Ordo. Why? Because it is now stripped of all dogmas to which Protestants objected in the 16th century and which they have rejected to this very day. We totally disagree with those who claim that one should never get angry. There is a just anger. There is a place for righteous indignation. It is a tragedy that too many of our bishops, priests, and lay people are failing to imitate our divine Lord in this manner. In this matter, turn to the pages of the gospel, and you will see that Jesus became angry. Did Jesus become angry when he was contradicted and rejected? No. Did he become angry when he was taken prisoner, when he was scourged and crowned with thorns? No. Was he angry at those who nailed him to the cross? 
No, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Was Jesus angry when the Pharisees mocked and insulted him while he was bleeding to death on the cross? No. There was only one time when Jesus became angry. That time was when his house of worship was being profaned. My house is a house of prayer, said he, but you have made it a den of thieves. And angrily he whipped the money changers out of the temple. The relevancy of such anger today is quite evident. The magnitude of the robberies going on in our church has no precedent in church history. The faithful are being robbed of the holy sacrifice of the mass. There is nothing more precious than this gift of God to man. There is nothing in heaven or on earth which has cost the Son of God more. As for some inescapable conclusions which follow from this robbery, I will merely suggest and let your intelligence do the rest. An elementary knowledge of church history is enough to realize that what is being enacted before our eyes today is a replay of the Protestant revolt of the 16th century. But yes, there is a difference. Then only a few countries were involved, whereas today this revolt, this revolt is worldwide. Compared with today's revolt, with today's techniques of instant global communications controlled by the modern Pharisees, the 16th century revolt looks li like a minor local family squabble. Today's revolt is not one of heretics, but a universal revolt by apostates against God and all that God and his one and only true church stands for. Like never before, the legions of Lucifer are engaged in a final battle against God and man. Who do you think is at the bottom of all this? Who do you think is the main cause of the sad situation of our one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Would you agree that a careful diagnosis in order to find the real cause is something like this? We first eliminate those which couldn't have caused it. Is it the cows and the horses, the dogs or cats, the mice or rats? Well, now, perhaps we better pause a moment here before I say yes. It is, that is, figuratively, for a long time we have been getting the infected milk of heresy from cows that look like a prize herd. And for a long time we've been hearing the wrong things right from the horse's mouth. Then, too, we note that our watchdogs have consistently failed to bark a warning. As for the purring cats, they were soundly asleep while the mice gnawed away and polluted the grain pile of dogma, morals, liturgy, and devotion. But leave it to the rats. The rats did their work well, infesting the foundations of the faith. They burrowed deeply into the law of worship, and thereby weakened and almost destroyed the law of believing. I must here repeat for emphasis, those things which have happened to our church and which are happening today could not possibly have happened unless our church were heavily infiltrated with traitors. And now back to these rats. These rats are gnawing at the very heart of their victim, the mystical Christ, this is precisely what the demolition of the true mass means. Destroy the mass and you destroy the church, the mystical body of Christ. Who is the Pied Piper controlling the rats and the multitude of misled children of our church? In case you find it difficult where to look, take an example to illustrate where to look. For instance, if you had, a, had the job of a, of, of a troubleshooting inspector for the YMCA, would you interview the last registrant? Of course not. You would first see the manager. Well then, the same must be done in the case of a parish, a diocese. You see the top, the top boss man, the big star of the show. As soon as you find things going all wrong, you may soon have to say, give an account of thy stewardship. 
for thou canst be steward no longer. As for the rest of this dialogue, I will allow your ingenuity to fill in whatever you might find as the appropriate words and actions to be taken with the mismanager. Know your enemies. Know your enemies. Then pray for them and protect yourself against them. There is no chance here to go into the necessary details of needed instructions on fundamentals of the most serious and sacred matters involved in these comments. All this is available in print and much of it on cassette tapes. I refer you to such matter as is contained in the booklet Papacy and Freemasonry by Monsignor Juan, uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, his Humanum Genus on the subject of Freemasonry, and by all means Pope St. Pius X's encyclical letter on the doctrines of the modernists called Pascendi Dominici Gregis, and his syllabus condemning the errors of the modernists, which is called Lamentabili Sane. As previously mentioned, you must become intimately familiar with the document uh, known as the Quo Primum and the Ottaviani Intervention, also available on tape, on tape cassettes. Most of these items, if not all, are available on such tape cassettes. Note the year when these things were published. For instance, Leo XIII in 1884, Pius X, 1907, Monsignor Juan, 1933. Wouldn't you think that such old documents as these could only be a relic of a dark past? Surprise! From these documents, you will be amazed to learn that there is not one original error offered by the modern modernists many of whom are in the highest positions of the church, they are boring from within, either knowingly or unknowingly. If unknowingly, they are incompetent. If knowingly, they are traitors. Let them take their choice. In case you might wish to go into matters more deeply, get your information from booklets or cassettes on subjects like progressive theology, the new theology, oriental theology, and so forth, all of which are replete with the lies of Satan wrapped up in tinsel words which betray their cheap and synthetic imitation of the truths of God, uh, which God has revealed and handed down to his one and only true church. Actually, the above on Freemasonry and modernism suffice for a good background of knowledge. It is important that you never allow your study to crowd out your daily rosary, not even the most essential study. Why? Because we have it from Our Lady that there is no problem which cannot be solved by the rosary, including the top problem, that of the true mass. The true mass has been suppressed and almost phased out universally. Since that began, the avalanche of evil has overwhelmed all humanity. Morality, down. Immorality, up. Vocations, down. Defections, up. Virtue, down. Vice, up. God, down. Man, up. Order, down. Chaos, up. And all this mainly because the sacrificial true mass is down while the sacrilegious novus ordo is up. The trend is now so evil that the murder of the unborn has been officially declared legal by the highest court in our land. Our land dedicated to the Immaculate Mother of God. Think of it. In that quasi-legal decision of our Supreme Court, all legality has now been officially brutalized because all brutality has by their decision been legalized. Our Lady assures us that God's cup of wrath is not only full, but is now overflowing. Apparently man has perverted his God-given intellect and will and will unto the foolishness of acting like an animal, thus forcing the lava of God's wrath to melt man right into hell itself. This process of man's demoralization and deterioration has never accelerated faster than since the true sacrifice mass has been blacked out. The family was the first victim to be de-Christianized and de-spiritualized, then de-supernaturalized and denaturalized, and finally, dehumanized and brutalized. 
Divine grace is absent because the source of grace, the true mass, has been phased out. Homes have become the democratic voting booth where the ballots for now legalized child murder were cast and are cast. God only knows how many of such homes were once truly Catholic homes. The source of all grace, graces, was blocked. This is why the cry of these murdered innocents is muffled and unheard. It is a mysterious tragedy that formerly sound Catholics are too blind to recognize this criminal process going on before their very eyes, let alone fighting against it with the courage of soldiers of Christ. Do they not know that man is never just an animal? Do they not know that man is either more than an animal or that he is less than an animal, but never just like an animal? Have they no eyes to see that when you take God out of society, you will have human brutishness dictating the murder of millions who stand in the way of their satanic success? Have these formerly good and sound Catholics never heard of the fact that over 50 million of such innocent victims in our own lifetime, not counting those who perished in the major wars, all victims crushed by the cruel heel of atheistic communism in Europe and Asia, when God is out, everything is out of order. When God is in, on the other hand, everything is in order. And when, as is the case today, the true mass is out, then all hell is out to get hell heavily populated during this mass blackout time, which Catholics have granted to their archenemy, Lucifer. Satan's successful efforts will go on until he is once more chained by the divine power flowing from the true renewal of the eternal sacrifice of Calvary. Did I mention hell and Satan? Of course I did. And of course I realize that there are today's even some priests who deny the existence of the devil or hell and of angels. It reminds me of the fellow who said to his pal, There ain't no hell, to which his Catholic pal retorted, the hell there ain't. A gratuitous assertion needs no other argument than a gratuitous denial. Jesus in the gospel speaks many times of a real hell of fire prepared for the devil and his angels into which human souls will be plunged who die unrepentant. But it is consoling to know that Jesus speaks again as often about a real heaven into which those who love God unto keeping his commandments will be welcomed with a come ye blessed and enjoy what God has prepared for those who love him. We hear so much about visual aids these days in our educational efforts. Consider the rosary as such a powerful visual aid. All I am saying is intimately relevant and inseparably related to the main subject of these comments, namely the true sacrifice mass. Look at the crucifix, the one on your rosary on which you begin saying your beads. You start there with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, in the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, in the true church founded by Jesus, in the forgiveness of sin on God's terms, and in life everlasting. The 15 mysteries are so many visual aids for the soul to be educated by them unto life everlasting. These 15 mysteries are Old Testament prophecies which have been fulfilled in the New Testament. What else is the gospel? In this, the rosary contains the whole gospel. Let us take a brief look at the three sets of mysteries, if for no other further reason than to see how perfectly relevant they are to the needs of every soul as well as to nations and to the world today. Take the joyful mysteries. Here we have the prologue of the story of God's tremendous love for man, the incarnation, God's becoming man. Here are taught the domestic virtues, how these are needed in the families today. Recall what I said about the systematic demoralization of the family now going on before our eyes. How could a loving and merciful God have done more for man than what he did do, becoming man, becoming like to man in all things except sin, while never 
ceasing to be God at the same time? Take the sorrowful mystery. Greater love no man has than that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus did that after suffering like no man ever suffered for love of you and me, to redeem you and me. If there were anything better for man than suffering of one kind or another, Jesus would have shown us. He taught us that if there is no cross, there will be no crown. This is a valley of tears. If you will be my disciple, take up your cross daily and follow me. My yoke is sweet and my burden is light. If we shy away from the splinters of the cross of our daily duties, we will surely inflict a heavier one on ourselves. He who keeps my commandments, he it is who loves me. Take the glorious mysteries. You and I will someday, perhaps sooner than we expect, hear the sentence of a judge. It will be the sentence of the merciful Savior, Jesus, then appearing as the all-just judge. What sentence will you hear? Will it be, come you blessed? Or, God forbid, will it be, depart you cursed? It will be the one or the other which you and I choose for ourselves in our daily routine round of duties demanded by our state of life. If we miss our only true goal of heaven, we will be miserable and everlastingly, and will be an everlasting failure. Forgetfulness of the future life must be conquered by its remembrance day after day. This prompts us to love God unto sacrifice. It prompts us to reject the false love of sensualism and anarchism. The remembrance of heaven's reward, which eye has not seen nor has ear heard, will urge us on unto total consecration to the sacred heart of Jesus, to the immaculate heart of Mary. The only real winning stance. The daily rosary? Yes. Why? Well, do you suppose that anyone who tries at all to meditate on the 15 mysteries after contemplating the eternal significance of the Apostles' Creed while holding the symbol of our salvation, the crucifix in our hands, do you suppose this can have no effect on your mind, your heart, your soul? No one could be so dull. The visual aids of the 15 mysteries, even casually contemplated, will help every soul make the right decisions which come up in their daily routine of duties. Back to the crucifix for a moment. That crucifix on your rosary. Would you wish to remove it from your rosary? Of course not. Well then, that crucifix is the symbol of the reality of Calvary's eternal sacrifice, of which the holy sacrifice of the Mass is the perpetual renewal, the reenactment by the direct command of Jesus. Do this in commemoration of me. That is, do what I have done. Change bread and wine into my body and blood, soul and divinity, really and truly consecrate, transubstantiate, as I have done, and then take and eat, take and drink. Our church has always taught that the entire Jesus is present in every drop of consecrated wine and in every particle of the consecrated bread. Please note the sacrilegious carelessness of some priests today in handling the Holy Eucharist, distributing Holy Communion in the hand, often from an ordinary bread basket instead of uh, 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 instead on the tongue from a proper saborium. This lack of faith betrays the lack of a proper intention for their Novus Ordo liturgy. Our Lady knows all about this so thoroughly. This is undoubtedly the reason why she has arranged that the crucifix be at the very beginning of a rosary. With her divine sense of priorities, she puts first things first. The crucifix, the symbol of the source of our grace, the symbol of its perpetual renewal in the true Mass. Our Lady here reminds us that without the true Mass, her rosary is incomplete. We are all so apt to forget the goal of our soul. The rosary reminds us of all we need to do to reach that goal. The crucifix, the joyful, the sorrowful, 
the glorious mysteries, these visual aids will conjure up the, the salient question, what does it matter in eternity? Where can I do the most good? How can I do the most good? How would our Lord and Our Lady want me to make this or that decision? These unlike questions lead to the preparedness of soul, which young and old need for the constant comfort in facing the realities of, of a possible sudden death, be it in air or surface travel, be it by earthquake, storm, fire, or whatever accident. Prayer and penance. This is the request of Our Lady in her many appearances to ward off the wrath of God's punishments. The rosary is her recommended prayer, and the penance of wearing the hair shirt of daily duty, each to his or her state of life. This is Mary's message, common to all her approved and her alleged appearances. There are priests who talk down and even condemn those who promote this peace plan from heaven. Yet these same priests do not condemn the immorality of micro-mini-skirted micro females who carry the bread and wine up the center aisle for their novus ordo, although Our Lady specifically warned against indecent and immoral style of dress. Oh, on second thought, perhaps we ought to concede the point uh, to such priests, namely uh, the relevant consistency between such immoral irreverence, irreverence and the sacrilege of the Novus Ordo, which they are performing. It may well be that such a satanic combination deserves the only validation which Lucifer and company could grant. If you think this is an exaggeration, just try this. Boldly insist on what our Divine Lord and Savior insisted, and see how quickly you will be called a fanatic, a reactionary, and perhaps some less compl complimentary names. The fact is that traditional Catholics are condemned for believing and doing what every Catholic had to believe and do under pain of mortal sin some ten years ago. Can such condemnations come from our unchangeable church? Or could they rather come from the counter-church, the synagogue of Satan? Let's look at a few of the questions which we hear people asking about the Mass. One, aren't we obliged to obey the Pope on such a matter? Two, isn't the Pope infallible on such an important matter? Three, what about Pope Paul's constitution on the Roman Missal? Four, are we to say no to the Pope's Novus Ordo and possibly be cut off from the Holy, Holy Catholic Church? Five, can a Pope teach the wrong things on the Mass? Six, if Pope St. Pius V could change the Mass, why can't Pope Paul do the same? Seven, if we can't follow the Pope, whom can we possibly follow with greater security? Here we have some sample objections to what is said on this tape in question form. The answer to these and like objections is contained in a correct understanding of just two words. These two words are infallibility and impeccability. It is most important that we understand the meaning of both these words very thoroughly. We will look at each word separately. What does infallibility mean? Infallibility means that the Pope cannot err when he teaches the universal church ex cathedra. That is, when he teaches officially as a successor of Peter with a clearly expressed intention to bind all the faithful. And this only on two things, namely on a doctrine of faith and a doctrine of morals. In our century, we were fortunate to have had such wonderful popes ranging from St. Pope Pius X to Pope Pius XII. It is quite normal on our part to have become accustomed to ascribe holiness, truthfulness, complete integrity of character, and so forth, to the person of the reigning pope. However, to ascribe impeccability to a pope is a heresy both in theory and in practice, as we shall see. This question was thoroughly settled in Council of Vatican I in 1870, and this was a dogmatic council, not a merely pastoral council as Vatican II. What does impeccability mean? Impeccability means that a person cannot commit a sin 
a wrong, a crime. No human creature is ever impeccable except only one, the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, because only she was full of grace, as the Archangel Gabriel declared, and to ascribe impeccability to anyone else, even a pope, is heretical by the church's official definition. The Protestant poet Wordsworth so well enshrined Our Lady as the only exception in the beautiful words, Our tainted nature's solitary boast. While it is praiseworthy for subjects to ascribe great virtue to their respective superiors, even imagined ones, the fact remains that to ascribe impeccability to anyone, even to a pope, is altogether heretical and completely wrong. History proves that we did have sinful popes, but thanks to the Holy Ghost, not one of them has ever attempted to teach ex cathedra and officially something wrong to the universal church. Never such a thing. It is worth emphasizing here that Pope Paul VI up to this day never once exercised his authority to speak ex cathedra during his reign on any matter of faith and morals. All truths which he expressed in his encyclical letters among the lesser uh, exactly stated truths, so far these were truths which were previously taught officially by his predecessors. No new dogma on faith and morals has ever been proclaimed by Pope John XXIII or Pope Paul VI. It is the most important that we use and apply these two terms correctly the terms infallibility and impeccability. No pope has ever claimed impeccability, but only infallibility, and this only on faith and morals when he speaks ex cathedra. Try to remember this. It clears up much confusion. Council Vatican II was not a dogmatic council, but a mere pastoral council. It was therefore a non-fallible council. In other words, a fallible council. Nothing at all in Council Vatican II had the stamp of papal infallibility. Nothing at all. Pope John made this plain at its very beginning, that there would be no new dogmas proclaimed, but that this council is only pastoral in nature. You know what has happened since. In the short course of less than a decade since the council's call, our church began to fall apart. It seethed in turmoil on every level. The so-called Catholic press and religious textbooks became replete with heretical tenets. Convents and monastic life was disrupted. Institutions of piety and learning closed, as well as many institutions of charity. Wholesale defections among the clergy, the religious, and the laity became common. All this and much more is a bitter fruit of an attempt to apply a more efficient pastoral policy by our churchmen. Remember, please, that these tragic consequences of the Council are not those of an infallible proclamation. Quite the contrary, and this in spite of Pope John's declaration that all previously defined dogmatic and moral principles stand as they are. He said that these principles would be made more understandable by the Council. What happened? A pastoral council became the cause, as well as the occasion, to uproot what previous dogmatic councils had decreed and defined infallibly. We have confusion, turmoil, chaos, deterioration, and demolition of both dogma and morals, truly a dismantling of the entire deposit of the divinely revealed truths of our faith. So much cockle in the green field, an enemy has done this. Yes, of course, but we can also point up the human cause. The more deeply you ponder the causalities, the more you will be convinced that the, eff the efficiency of the deceptive deterioration was largely caused by the false application of the heretical attribute of impeccability to both popes and council, Vatican II, as also a false application of the true attribute of infallibility. That the laity did this is understandable, wrong as it is, but that this was allowed to go on by hierarchy, this is less understandable, 
hardly excusable and criminally wrong by default. That any misunderstanding of this matter was not cleared up long ago would seem to indicate conscious and deliberate deception on the part of official teachers of our church, the bishops and under them the pastors of parishes, whoever and wherever they are. They defaulted. Most pastors act as if their bishop, the Pope, and Vatican II were endowed with impeccability, in spite of the fact that in the last 15 years, not even infallibility was invoked by Popes John and Paul. Consequently, most pastors are not on a safe track. Some pastors compromise on two tracks. And rarely do you find a pastor who takes a firm stand, say on some real dogmatic and moral grounds, as one such takes a firm stand in a St. Paul, Minnesota parish against an encroaching educational bureaucracy, there is hardly time to go into more details, <clears throat> as I would like to, regarding the false application of impeccability and uh, uh, infallibility. But uh, let it be said that people keep saying but our, our bishop is such a holy man. How could he do anything wrong? Or you should meet our pastor. He's the soul of kindness and understanding. He couldn't ask us anything wrong. Heretical impeccability. Implied impeccability all the way through. And recall this. The false assumption that faithful cannot re recognize what is wrong. Recall that as a child you were taught in the Catholic school that children must obey their parents in all things except sin and wrong when commanded by their parents. Now then, do you suppose it's too much to assume that bishops and pastors who have had an education in philosophy and theology are not able to recognize sin and wrong if commanded by their respective superiors? So there you have it. Apply this, please, to the various situ varying situations which you meet. And now, <clears throat> why do, if Pius the St. Pope Pius V could uh, change the Mass, why couldn't Paul the Sixth? you say? Well, Pope Pius V did not change the Mass. What he did do in obedience to the dogmatic Council of Trent is to restore the true Mass for all time. During that 16th century Protestant revolt, the Mass, along with other things, had deteriorated much as we sing, see things deteriorate today and needed to be restored to its apostolic and traditional purity. This was a laborious task extending over years by men of scholarly competence and saintly character. And this these men did. They codified and enshrined the treasure of the true mass in the most dignified and classic form, worthy of being thus preserved in perpetuity. There was nothing wrong with the true mass for Pope Paul VI to correct and change. And as a matter of fact, may we add, Pope Paul VI did not change the mass either. Uh, the fact is that there has always been a perennial conflict going on from the beginning between Christ and Satan for souls. And your soul is the prize for which Lucifer is fighting with satanic hatred against you. The only obstacle standing his way between you and him is the eternal sacrifice of Calvary and its continued renewal and repetition in the true holy sacrifice of the Mass. That is why all satanic efforts are first and foremost directed against the true mass and against the Holy Mother of God, whose heel is constantly crushing the head of Satan through the true mass. What Lucifer opposes first and foremost is precisely what you and I must defend with all our might first and foremost. I have no other motive than that which prompts these, than that one which prompts these, com these comments and which I sincerely hope will occasion a more eloquent, a more elegant, and more learned defense of the true Mass in the near future by those whose primary duty this is. Nothing in defense of the true Mass can possibly be too much, only too little, and may we hope not too late. Our Lady warns us that the cup of God's wrath is filled to the brim and overflowing. We must work and pray do penance and bring sacrifices. Remember, fervent prayer begets fruitful action, and fruitful action is long overdue. The fruitless flailing of arms in despair won't do. Ineffective and half-hearted action won't do. 
nothing less than total consecration to the heart of Christ, who totally consecrated his heart to us in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Nothing less than that will do. The sacred heart of Jesus keeps mercifully pleading and beating for us, even while ungrateful men keep planting a cruel cross into it, while men encircle that heart with a crown of thorns of unrequited love, the thorns of coldness and neglect, of indifference and sin, that heart which is surrounded by the flames of divine love for man is constantly being pierced by man's lance of rejection. That sacred heart wants to enkindle the world with the fire of his divine love. Will you respond gratefully, wholeheartedly? The mystical Jesus will win. I will reign in spite of my enemies, Jesus assures us. He has promised to be with us all days, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him, who is the pillar and ground of truth, his mystical body, his church. Will you be with him all days? Woe to those who work to destroy his church. Woe to those who work to destroy the very heart of his church. Woe to those who think they will get through the golden gate of heaven in spite of their lazy, cold, ungrateful, and compromising indifference to God's greatest gift to man, the holy sacrifice of the mass. God willing, we will meet again by tape when I continue this series, tape on the true mass number three. God bless you. We need the help of an almighty God. Join me, please. Holy Michael, the archangel, defend us in the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wiles and the wickedness of the devil. Restrain him, O God, we humbly beseech thee, and to thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the destruction of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.